Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 130. This week the questions are taken from guide 193 on the USS Midway and the Wednesday video on the Kantai Kessin Japanese Decisive Battle Doctrine. So, onwards with questions. Mark Joseph J. Lagara, I think, uh, asks, were battle cruisers still viable by World War II? I would argue yes, and in some ways they were actually technically more viable than they perhaps necessarily were in World War I. Uh, that might seem a little bit of an interesting take, but I'll try to explain in the few minutes that we have here in the dry dock. Back in World War I, the two countries that were building battle cruisers, primarily Britain and Germany, effectively ended up building them to counter each other. So they became a kind of just a fast ancillary arm of the battle line when some of them really weren't designed for that. And because of the sheer effectiveness of battle cruisers in their originally designed role, they kind of did themselves out of a job fairly early. They killed off pretty much all the major German cruisers that you could reasonably expect them to find. But the process of the Washington Treaty and the restrictions both on fleet size overall and on the size of specific ships meant that the few battle cruisers that survived through to the Second World War were pretty much the best of the bunch. And the kinds of threats that had grown up since then in the forms of uh, the British, things like the Deutschland class and the Scharnhorst, for example, and in the Japanese case, the fact that the American battle line remained at a steady 21 knots and still technically was at the end of 1941, since North Carolina was still working up and had some speed issues, so wasn't actually really ready for a full battle line deployment just yet, meant that the speed of the battle cruisers actually became much more of a significant issue because with the kind of the, the cutting of a lot of their competition, they were somewhat unique in that kind of circumstance of being extremely heavily armed and extremely fast as far as warships went. And with the growth of newer threats that could exploit newer technology to move faster, battle cruisers remained one of the few things that could actually hunt down and kill them. Um, there's a, certainly a certain argument to say even things like the Dunkirks probably fit the battle cruiser paradigm a bit better than they do the battleship one. So if you look at the Royal Navy, they've got renowned repulse and hood. And you look at the some of the threats, you've, as we say, we've got the Deutschlands. Um, they can take on any single heavy cruiser in one-on-one -on -one combat. They can't run away from, nor can they fight one of those three battle cruisers. Similarly, the Scharnhorsts, whilst they're a lot closer to matching, certainly at least the renowns, we see from things like the action of Lofoten, they weren't too keen to tar tangle with something like renown, let alone hood. So that gave the Royal Navy something that not only could deter the Scharnhorst, I mean, HMS Malaya could deter the Scharnhorsts, but could actually follow them and force them into battle if they, so if the Royal Navy so choose. And of course, of course, the Royal Navy did so choose. Additionally, with other battleships until the vast battleships of the treaty era could come online in large numbers the battle cruisers would be the only things that could escort the carriers and keep up with the carriers if the carriers were doing full operations there were some issues that were encountered and obviously they had to learn from them in operations in the mediterranean when uh, the mediterranean fleet was going around and their kind of battleship top speed was in the low to mid 20s of knots but the carriers could do a lot faster. Whereas if you look at something like Force H, deploying with Arc Royal and Renown for extended periods, Renown could quite happily keep pace with Arc Royal, doing whatever Arc Royal needed to do. And the Japanese had the same kind of experience in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. The Congos could keep up with Akito Butai, so that they had a powerful surface escort, either to deal with potential surface threats or to send after potential surface targets. And as it turned out, this somewhat unexpected side effect of having the Congos for the Japanese was that they had capital ships that could run in and out of American air cover, such as the range of American air cover dictated in the early part of the Pacific War, without exposing themselves to air attack overnight in things like the Guadalcanal campaign. 
And of course, as we said, because of the caps on treaty cruisers, they could quite happily deal with any treaty cruiser they happened to come across. So there were plenty of things that battle cruisers could viably be used for. And indeed, obviously, I mean, Hood and Repulse got sunk relatively early in the war, but the Royal Navy got a lot of use out of Renown. And Renown was a considerably more useful ship to them than, say, many of the R class as individual ships would be. Of course, once fast battleships came around that could hit 28, 30 or 30 plus knots and carry full battleship grade armour and full battleship grade armament in terms of both numbers as well as calibre of guns, the utility of battle cruisers began to diminish somewhat because they only had, well, one and a half of those things. But it took a while for those ships to come fully online in the various navies and there for even once they did, there weren't that many of them, so the battle cruiser was still a huge force multiplier. Live Errors asks, is the reason why the secondary battery on Midway is considered okay, whilst on Graf Zeppelin it isn't, because of the sheer size difference? The answer is no, it's nothing to do with size. The reason why the Midway's large battery of 18 5-inch 54 caliber guns is considered a good thing, and the German battery of 16 uh, six inch guns is not considered a good thing is because the midways guns are dual purpose and therefore can be used in the anti-aircraft role and being long barrel weapons they basically cancel out the one significant disadvantage of the five inch 38 caliber gun which is a slightly more limited range compared to some other heavy anti-aircraft guns whereas well yeah you're not getting anti-aircraft use out of double casement anything um, let alone the double casement 6 inch guns or 5.9 inch technically that were mount going to be mounted on the Graf Zeppelin in the locations they were um, because that meant that the sole heavy anti-aircraft battery of the Graf Zeppelin was a dozen 105mm guns and well a dozen 105mm guns compared to 18 5 inch guns just saying the numbers and the calibers pretty much gives you an idea of the gap and that's not even going into the uh, quality issues between the German uh, Flak 38105mm and the American 5-inch 54. MP asks, what if Australia had implemented the Jellico plan from the report on the naval mission to the Commonwealth in the 1920s? So for those of you unaware, Jellicoe's plans, which were come up with in the immediate aftermath of World War I, um, he basically called for a very large, very powerful fleet to be stationed in the Far East, and that was go to guard British interests in the Pacific Ocean, and that should be a sort of combined British-Australian-New Zealand fleet, Britain bearing the brunt of the cost, but the Australians fronting up about one-fifth of the costs, and he suggested that the Australian Navy should have a carrier, a couple of battle cruisers, a couple of divisions of light cruisers, a uh, flotilla of destroyers, a uh, flotilla of submarines with their relative support ships and some smaller auxiliaries as well. And to be clear, this was a huge fleet he was proposing, because that's just the Australian component. The entire fleet, including the Australian component, was supposed to include eight modern battleships, eight battle cruisers, so basically a Japanese 8-8 plan on Japan's doorstep, except this was just Britain's Eastern Pacific force, um, 10 cruisers, 40 destroyers, so two to three squadrons of cruisers, four flotillas of destroyers, flotilla leaders, depot ships, um, three flotillas of submarines, four aircraft carriers, and the list goes on into smaller stuff. Now, of this force, he suggested initially being one new battle cruiser plus the Australia, and then replacing the Australia with a newer battle cruiser later on. And he's suggesting the first battle cruiser should become in sort of mid 1920s, the second, the Australia replacement, in the later 1920s. Now, one of the things to be clear on is that the Australian Navy and the nation did not have the industrial capacity to support or build this kind of fleet. Um, they could expand some of their existing facilities, like this one, which you can see, which is Cockatoo Island, um, but there is basically no chance that they were going to develop a yard that could build a couple of battle cruisers and an aircraft carrier anytime soon. 
the cruisers and everything smaller than that theoretically they could build will be even then, they'd need uh, quite considerable expansion of infrastructure to build that many. So it'd probably be a case of a few being built on Australia. The rest would have to be ordered from British yards. Now, the sheer cost involved of this, around about just over £4 million a year, that would be a huge investment and would completely change the board on Australian naval uh, procurement, naval maintenance, what their defence budget, what their national budget was going to be doing at that point. Um, Australian Navy interwar period stuff seems to be relatively popular as a subject in recent dry docks. Nevertheless, if they had gone ahead and implemented it, the first thing you'd need to implement it would be Australia would have to have a separate seat at the Washington Naval Treaty table, because that far eastern fleet is not happening with the Washington Naval Treaty. The reason the, that the HMAS Australia had to be uh, disposed of was because Australia was sort of lumped in with the, the rest of the British Empire at the Washington Treaty uh, negotiating table. So if Australia had managed to say, well, actually, we're going to have our own seat, we're going to have our own navy, we want a place here, they probably could have argued for something along the lines of France or Italy's displacement allocations maybe a little bit less I mean they don't need anything close to that they could get away with a rather than a 1.75 they could get away with a one ratio on the capital ships and still be quite comfortably under that with Jellicoe's plan as for what kind of battle cruisers they would be well the British had a few ideas on battle cruisers before the set of designs that would eventually lead to the G3 were shaken out so if they had I mean, a lot of them, sort of various 18-inch gunned ships, etc., would have fallen afoul of the treaty restrictions anyway. They did have some ideas immediately post World War One, and then immediately post Treaty for battle cruisers with triple 15-inch turrets. Um, Pre-Washington Treaty, they looked rather conventional, um, kind of like modified versions of HMS Hood. Post treaty, there was a 35,000 ton battle cruiser drawn up that was sort of Nelson like but faster. So, there are ways to play this, and it, it's more to do with the order in which the ships are built. And obviously, we're exercising foreknowledge, which they wouldn't have had. But if, with a bit of hindsight, you want to say, well, what's the best way for them to implement that? It's to build the sh capital ships first, because if they build a Sort of high 20s, low 30s um, battle cruiser with decent armour and 9 15-inch 42 calibre guns, then that's going to be a pretty lethal unit even well into World War II, especially if it gets updated or modernised. Certainly it's going to give the Congos something of a big, big pause. You don't want to be building the carrier till the 30s, because if you build the carrier in the 20s, you're going to end up with probably either buying Furious or or something like a slightly enlarged Hermes, whereas if you order it some point in the 30s, you might end up with something like a second Ark Royal, which would be considerably better. Um, as far as the cruisers go, again, probably something you want to hold off on ordering a little bit. Uh, so probably you get the battle cruisers out the door first, then probably the destroyers in the late 20s, because to be perfectly honest, right up until you the very end of the 1930s <laughs> Royal Navy destroyer design which the Australians would have been copying or ordering is pretty much much for muchness so that's fine and then as you get into the 1930s that's when you order your carrier so you order a, probably a second Ark Royal something along those lines maybe a diminutive who knows um, and then you sort of get in on the early train with something like a uh, town or something, and then you're kind of blending into what the Australians actually ordered anyway. That would be the the ideal order of doing things. I would I would say. The worst order of doing things would be to order the light cruisers and the carrier first, so you get basically Hermes and some E, e class or Hawkins class equivalents, and wait until post treaty for the battle cruisers. At which point they don't probably get into commission until pretty much around about the time Australia's at war, if that. Um, so yeah, it, it would be an interesting uh, scenario if Australia had that force. It would certainly give the Japanese some rather interesting pause for thought, um, but quite how they're deployed would affect their utility. Because the thing is, remember, Australia would join the war along with 
uh, the British, the rest of the British Empire in 1939. So whilst that force might be a very powerful check on the Japanese if it's still in Australian waters, I think if you've got two pretty sweet high-speed 15-inch battle cruisers with decent armour and an Ark Royal style carrier, etc., in Australian waters in 1939-1940, oh boy, they're going to be in the Mediterranean post haste. Um, if uh, the Royal Navy has anything to say about it. Mind you, the the idea of a couple of Australian battle cruisers decently designed chasing off after the Italians in the 1940-1941 period does give me a big smile on my face, but oh well. Christopher Babillon asks, Speaking of heavy cruisers, I've heard from many sources that the French cruiser Algerie was one of the best treaty built heavy cruisers. Is this true? Also, in a one on one, how would it fare against a Hippa or a Zara, the Italian cruiser? Uh, thanks in advance. Ah, yes, the Algerie. <laughs> Another one of those French ships that just proves the French do not understand the meaning of the word mediocre. I mean, seriously, look at French warship design. Well, pretty much going all the way back in well into the age of sail and up past up to 1950 and i challenge you to find a single french warship where you can look at it and go yeah it's all right you won't you'll, you'll either find ships which are just going why 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 did you design this and what were you on and hopefully were you given a very long prison sentence and possibly an execution afterwards or you'll find ships that both look really good and are actually pretty superb pieces of naval architecture there is no in between with french warship design algerie falls on the good side of this equation um one of the advantages dash disadvantages that she has versus a hippa or azara is that she actually follows the washington naval treaty restrictions when it comes to displacement which you might think is going to put her at something of a disadvantage versus the hippas which are sort of almost depending on which one you're going at, looking at either somewhere between 40 and 60 percent heavier than they should be and the zaras which are ostensibly 15 to 20 percent heavier than they should be and probably a bit more than that but nevertheless algerie is such a good design she's actually competitive with both um one on one i would give an algerie what well, the algerie quite a decisive advantage over the average admiral hippa um, it's better protected, it's about the same speed, they've got a similar kind of armament, and unlike the Germans, Algerie shells actually do relatively reliably explode. Now, against a Zara class, she might have a bit more of a problem, which you might think is a bit odd, because the Zara class is um, kind of the middleweight of the three. But the Zara class does have substantially heavier armour protection, that's the heaviest armour protection of all three. They're all roughly comparable in speed, and they all have eight eight-inch guns in four twin turrets. However, with the advantage that Algerie has over the Italian uh, cruiser is that whilst the Italian cruiser shells don't have any problems exploding, unlike the Hippers, they do have a problem actually hitting anything, and it's not just, um, in the Zara's case, shell quality, which plagued the Italians generally during the Second World War, in the Zara's case, it was the fact that the guns are just a little bit too close. They did work on things to resolve it, but they never quite managed to work it out completely. So, Algerie, of the three, is the only one with guns that, after a bit of uh, fiddling around after launch, actually will hit somewhere in the vicinity of what they're aimed at, and when they hit, might actually explode reliably. Which is kind of a bit of a combat advantage in an environment where you know you're firing explosive shells at someone and trying to hit them and make them explode so <laughs> there you go and as i say she's reasonably well protected and pretty quick it looks nice too so yeah algerie definitely one of the best treaty but era cruisers next up we're asked if u.s aircraft carriers are named after battles where did enterprise come from the naming of U.S. carriers after battles was, to be honest, a little bit of a hit and miss affair initially. Um, when you look at them, I mean, obviously you've got, yes, Lexington, Saratoga. They're obviously named after battles, but there was no Battle of Langley. Um, in fact, there was no ship called USS Langley before the first aircraft carrier. That was named after a uh, famous astronomer. 
then immediately after you have the after the Lexingtons, you have the USS Ranger, and again, there's no Battle of Ranger. Um, you then you've got Yorktown, obviously, yes, Battle of Yorktown. And then you have Enterprise, which uh, yeah, there's no Battle of Enterprise, but there's also no Battle of Wasp and no Battle of Hornet, no Battle of Essex either. So amongst the first ten or so U.S. carriers, actually carriers named after battles were the minority. It's only once you really got going into the Essex class production line that you began to see a consistent policy being taken. Ranger, Enterprise, Wasp, Hornet, and also Essex were all named after ships of the early U.S. Navy. In fact, most of them after ships that originally had their namesakes in the Continental Navy, the pre immediate predecessor to the U.S. Navy, uh, Enterprise being one of them. There were a whole string of Enterprises back in the early days of the U.S. Navy, one of which is shown here, and that's where the name basically came from. And then we're asked, why was U.S. industry in general and shipbuilding industry specifically so underestimated in both world wars? When it comes to shipbuilding, I can't really comment on aircraft and the land-based munitions industries etc all that much but although i do know for world war one they weren't really that underestimated in fact they were a little bit short in most areas apart from small arms to the degree that they were armed quite a bit with uh, french and british weaponry because um, american production couldn't keep up in world war one but that apart from that would talk about shipbuilding in World War One, the shipbuilding industry wasn't really underestimated because the American shipbuilding industry wasn't nearly as well developed as you might imagine. Um, in large part because Congress just kept refusing to pay for things. Um, as I've covered many times before, your ability to put ships in the water, warships specifically, is generally limited by your ability to build the niche products of warship designs so extremely heavy artillery for your battleships big slams of armor plate etc large-scale machinery etc these kinds of things now with congress throttling the u.s navy's production capacity for so long limiting it effectively outside of the new mexico class to a couple of battleships a year and the only reason you've got three is because they sold off two old pre-dreadnoughts to greece and used the money to pay for a third one um it meant that there was a limit on what the U.S. war industries of the, of the time could produce. And that put a hard limit on the large ships that the U.S. in turn could build. Now, they did have a small amount of extra capacity. Um, they built the River Davias for Argentina, for example, and they, provide, they were going to provide the 14-inch guns for the Salamis. But... Outside of coastal artillery contracts and the like, the U.S. shipbuilding industry for warships for the majority of the First World War simply didn't have that kind of massive legendary build capacity that it would later become known for. It achieved it to a degree with things like the Wicks and Clemson swarm towards the end of the First World War, but that was partly an early effect of the various naval acts that were passed in 1916 which suddenly opened the floodgates to funding and also because american industry got very very rich off of the first world war so lots of money was coming in so by the end of world war one the beginnings of this massive shipbuilding warship building industrial capacity that would then lend itself to the kind of naval ambitions that the americans had on paper for the 19 late 1910s and early 1920s was now there but 1914 1516 etc no world war Two, with obviously all this industry having then been built taken a bit of a hit during the uh, interwar period and then been built back up again in the mid to late 30s that wasn't really underestimated um the Japanese, for example, especially people like Yamamoto, they knew exactly what America could do if it really, really got up ahead of steam. They just didn't think they, the Americans would have the motivation to do so, um, which, as it turned out, was, uh, shall we say, something of a mistake. Yeah, by the start of World War II, pretty much everyone had a good idea of what American industrial capacity could be. Um, it's just to say the, the Japanese had this idea that they could discourage the Americans from putting it to use. Uh, Winston Churchill was 
although obviously not in charge of the government at the beginning of the Second World War, but certainly Churchill and a number of others were sitting back going, well, that um, that's kind of our, our fallback plan in case um, Britain gets knocked out of the war. The Germans were largely concentrating initially on beating up everybody in Europe and not too concerned about American industry because they weren't planning on going to war with America until Hitler decided that going to war with America was a brilliant idea around about the same time as he decided that going to war with Russia at the same time was also a brilliant idea. Um, so yeah, possibly not the greatest decision maker of that particular point in time. Bjorn Larsen asks, could Japan have beaten the Spanish fleet and invaded the Philippines before the Spanish-American War? For the stuff the Spanish actually had there, certainly. Um, if you look at, for example, the fleet that the Japanese took to the Battle of the Yalu River in the First Sino-Japanese War, that fleet, bunch of protected cruisers, um, various smaller ships, at least they're vaguely modern, yeah, that could quite easily have dealt with the Spanish fleet that was in the Philippines at the time. And by the time you're looking at sort of 1898, the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, they've also managed to get the Fuji and Yashima into service. So a couple of modern pre-dreadnought battleships as well. Um, so definitely nothing that the Spanish can actually stop at that point. Dornian Sorgel asks, how important was the Gibraltar naval base and control of the Straits for the Royal Navy? What kind of consequences would it have had if the British didn't control it in World War One, World War II, or the Napoleonic Wars? Is there another war where it would have had serious consequences? It was hugely important to British and Royal Navy strategy ever since the time that they, well, took it off of Spain and then sorry Spain you did kind of sign it away in perpetuity so um, yeah you're not getting it back anytime soon um, that's the way treaties work nevertheless during the Napoleonic Wars control of Gibraltar was very very important because well he who controls Gibraltar controls access to the Mediterranean period and there was a an awful lot of trade going on in the Mediterranean lots of uh, during the Napoleonic Wars various British allies in the Mediterranean as well and it was also fairly important for safeguarding, believe it or not, India, because the British were very worried, amongst other things, that Napoleon could try what he actually did try, which was to get a French army, take it to somewhere like Toulon, which obviously is within the Mediterranean, sail across to uh, Egypt, take over Egypt, and from there just kind of waltz his way into British India, which they really, really, really didn't want him to do. Um, hence things like the Battle of the Nile. Now, obviously, control of Gibraltar doesn't stop the French at Toulon from doing things, but it does mean that the British have access into the Mediterranean to go in and try and stop him from doing those things. Whereas if the Spanish still held Gibraltar and had a relatively powerful fleet based in the area, they could, if they're allied with the French block Britain out of Gibraltar, out of the Mediterranean, and then they're really in trouble. Once you get the Suez Canal going, then obviously it's no longer the point of access to the Mediterranean, but of course, um, having recognised that, the British print promptly made sure that they had control over the Suez Canal. Um, so they had access to both ends of the Mediterranean. Now, at that point, actually, Control Gibraltar became even more important because now not only was there trade inside the Mediterranean and the theoretical access towards India from the other end of the Mediterranean, there was also an awful lot of transitory trade going from the Pacific and Indian Oceans up via the Suez Canal across the Mediterranean and through into the Atlantic via Gibraltar. So once again, you could stop that trade for your enemies and you could guarantee that trade for yourself. Uh, in the in the First World War, if the British didn't have control of Gibraltar, it depends who does. In the First World War and the Second World War, to be perfectly honest, if Spain has control of Gibraltar, the consequences aren't anywhere near as bad as an active hostile having control of Gibraltar, but the fact that Brit the British controlled Gibraltar made it much more difficult, although not obviously not impossible, for the Germans to get U-boats in and out of the Mediterranean. It made it practically impossible for the Italian fleet to get out of the Mediterranean if for some reason they want to go and help the Kriegsmarine in World War II. Um, it stopped the Germans from getting in in both World Wars, either to help the Austro-Hungarians in the First World War or the Italians in the Second in any substantial manner beyond U-boats. And as I say, it provided a base for 
the securing of trade and the securing of things like French troop movements in the First World War, and also provided a launch point for reinforcements for to Malta and resupply, etc., and new ships to the British Mediterranean fleet, which they wouldn't have been able to do anywhere near as easily had they not had it. So yeah, it's critically important, and it's pretty much one of, if not the biggest reasons, why Britain retains control of Gibraltar. Richard Malcolm asks, Why did the Royal Navy choose to equip HMS Terror and HMS Erebus with absurdly weak 25-horsepower locomotive engines on the ill-fated 1845 Franklin expedition, when it had much more powerful marine engines already in use, for example HMS Rattler with a 200-horsepower steam engine? So there are a few reasons for that, one of which is, to be honest, Erebus and Terror were not large ships. Um, they displaced something around 450 tons by modern standards, um, which means that something like Rattler, which, as you mentioned, has more, much more powerful engines, is about twice the displacement and about two-thirds bigger in all dimensions, therefore has the space to fit a much more powerful engine. Additionally, bearing in mind that uh, Terra and Erebus were converted bomb vessels, they're already fairly heavily built as compared to Rattler, and they were further um, reinforced with things like iron plates, cross beams, etc., plus massive amounts of supplies and so forth. So the internal volume on what was already a much smaller ship was reduced still further again compared to what you'd have on just a, a random Royal Navy ship of about the same displacement. So there really wasn't all that much space in there. And again, they were refits. They weren't um, purpose-built, so there's limitations in there. And they're being outfitted for a specific mission rather than as a long-term thing. They're also not supposed to be going particularly quickly. The steam engines were there to give them some degree of maneuverability without sail, but not not go particularly fast. They were as much to provide heating for the for the ship as anything else. And so, with all those considerations in mind, it was thought that, well, a 25-horsepower locomotive engine ought to be good enough. Um, and that's why they, they ended up with those particular power plants. Blue-Eyed Buckeye asks a fairly substantial question. He says, is it possible the conventional narrative that the Kantai Kessen didn't happen is wrong? And the truth is, the Kantai Kessen did happen, and it was the naval battle of Leyte Gulf. The Japanese just lost it decisively. Uh, put the shoe on another foot. In an alternate universe where the US Navy blundered and the Japanese improbably won an overwhelming victory at Leyte Gulf, would Admirals not be popping the champagne that they had won the big Kantai Kessen? I mean, I can see the argument, but at the same time, people put, sometimes put forward that Midway was the Kantai Kessen or um, Pearl Harbor was the Kantai Kessen, or sort of these big decisive battles. And as you say, then the Japanese just either lost or didn't pull off quite the level of success they needed. Um, the one problem I have with any of those ideas is that the Decantai Kessen Doctrine, the decisive battle doctrine, at its core, calls for the engagement and destruction of the majority of the enemy's forces using the majority of your forces. And when you look at it by that metric, none of those battles fit that category. The attack on Pearl Harbor, whilst it did do a lot of damage to uh, the US fleet, it didn't destroy the American carriers, as we know, albeit that was partially luck of the draw. It also, however, didn't destroy the majority of American battleships. I mean, it didn't even destroy all the battleships at Pearl Harbor, but even if, well, not, let's not say even if it did, but even if we take into account that, well, all the battleships that were there had some degree of damage or another, so weren't immediately available, the US still had Arkansas, it still had Texas, it still had New York, it still had New Mexico, it still had Mississippi, Idaho, um, Colorado, North Carolina and Washington were around uh, working up. And, of course, ships like uh, Tennessee, Maryland, and Pennsylvania would be back in action pretty quickly anyway. So, yeah, it, it wasn't an engagement with the majority of the U.S. fleet. 
and it didn't destroy a majority of the US fleet. Um, similarly with Midway, to be honest, on, on both sides, it was a war between most, but not all, of Japan's operational carriers and the operational aircraft carriers that the Americans had in the Pacific, but not all of them. Um, that they, not all of the American carrier fleet and no battleships were involved, so at least in direct action. So, yeah, not really can't I guess. And, and then when you get to Leyte Gulf, yeah, okay, fair enough. The Japanese were pretty much throwing everything in the, but the kitchen sink at the um, <laughs> at, at the Allied forces, the American forces. But even then, at that point, whilst the Japanese were committing the majority of their fleet, so one half of the doctrine. Even if they'd gone on a complete rampage and taken out everything, they could even sort of even a slight stretch have taken out. By that point, the U.S. fleet was just far too big. They they couldn't engage the majority of the U.S. fleet because the majority of the U.S. fleet wasn't there. Um, as I say, even if they'd wiped out Taffy Three, wiped out Taffy's One and Two, even if Seventh Fleet had come up and they'd somehow wiped them out out and sat around bombarding all the transports and the landing ships and the landed troops and everything until such time as Halsey could eventually get the fast battleships and fleet carriers turned around to come back and deal with them it would have been a tragic loss of American lives it would have been a massive loss of American equipment and it would have changed nothing in terms of the overall outcome of the war because at that point the American fleet was so large that even with all those gone you wouldn't have affected the fleet carrier strength of the U.S. Navy one iota. You wouldn't have affected the modern fast battleship strength of the U.S. Navy one iota. The Fletcher Swarm was would have been a very slightly dinged. Um, yeah, the the Kanto Kessin say it calls for this decisive strike against the bulk of the enemy battle fleet. L l the best way I can think of describing it would be even in a optimal Japanese setting outcomes we just described it would sting but the US Navy would go this isn't even my final form and then there would be pain and on to the Patreon questions M Flash asks I've seen it written that the machinery of the Admiral Hippo class cruisers caused them problems and prevented them from being effective ships what were these issues oh there were so many problems with Hippo class design <laughs> The engine plants, the machinery plants just being one of them. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I criticise Bismarck for being an inefficient design. The Hippas are just as bad. I mean, they're oh, this is the thing. The Hippa, Hippas are okay-ish if they're going to fight a treaty-era cru cruiser. But they're 60% heavier. <laughs> that's not a ringing endorsement. I mean, th th that's a level of... That's that, that, that's the best way of describing it. Okay, at that kind of displacement difference ratio, that's like, let's say, if America had built the Iowa class and then sent the Iowa to fight the Scharnhorst, and the outcome on on paper would have looked something like a 50-50 eh, coin toss. <laughs> that's the kind of gap we're talking about proportionally anyway the machinery the germans like the americans wanted to get more out of their engine spaces by going for very high pressure machinery high pressure boilers and everything um and they did this on the hippers the shan horse and the bismarcks but the problem with the german high pressure machinery was it was incredibly complex it was very finicky and delicate. If something broke, you normally needed a specialist from somewhere um, outside of the ship's realm of expertise, usually from the engine manufacturers or boiler manufacturers themselves to come in and fix it, which is obviously not necessarily a problem uh, and something that you can actually do when you're out at sea. Um, and on top of that, the machinery plant had loads and loads of smaller ancillary machines that all needed to be fed from the main machinery all of which also were quite finicky and specialist and required a lot of care and attention and a lot of which needed to be run continuously and therefore the ships were pretty much burning off oil at a fairly worrying rate even when they were stationary 
um, but active. And all of this meant that to, to sort of to keep on top of it all, you either had to be ridiculously well trained and almost OCD like in your manic focus on keeping these things fixed and running, or potentially you had to be like an eight armed spider mutant with six engineering degrees. Um, those both of those things are kind of in short supply in World War Two, and this meant that even if you somehow managed to get everything working and keep it working via a mixture of chaos, luck, and duct tape. Once something broke, it was like, well, uh, that's not getting fixed until we get back into port. Uh, I mean, for example, Prince Eugen, once it broke off from Bismarck, uh, it headed off into the Atlantic, theoretically, with the Royal Navy somewhat distracted by its, um, its large cousin, should have been able to go off and savage a few convoys. Oh, look, the machinery plant had problems, so off back home they went um <laughs> well back to occupied france at least and that was that for prince eugen problems cropped up with hipper i'm sure problems would have cropped up with blucher except the norwegians cropped up and that was a much bigger problem for blucher um so well there you go and yeah that that was a little bit of an achilles heel in the hipper class design and as i mentioned before in other questions um when they took Prince Eugen over to the States, they were like, sort of like, okay, yep, high pressure machinery, we know how to deal with this. Thank you very much, German crew, you can all go home. And Prince Eugen's machinery probably went, ah, yeah, you Americans, you do not know how to maintain me. Good, good break. <laughs> Pretty much. I think the only thing that's ever been more decisively broken than Prince Eugen's machinery um, during its service with the US was that Alpha class submarine where its liquid metal <laughs> reactor coolant went solid. Next we have, uh, in 1942, we all know which one. I, think I know enough about the Dutch pronunciation to know that I can't do it very well. So we all know which Dutch ship we're talking about, the one that disguised itself as an island um, to get away from the Japanese. Anyway, it did that. The question goes on to say, have any other vessels successfully used camouflage in this manner? Well, not quite to the same degree. There were a number of other Allied warships, mainly American ones, in the Pacific Theatre that, after, usually after they'd sustained some fairly heavy damage, dis took, took a leaf out of the Dutch book and would disguise themselves as islands quite heavily, although, again, no, with nowhere near the same level of success or quite to the same level of ambition as the Dutch, um, in order to hide themselves from Japanese air attack. But yeah, nothing quite to this level. There were some other cases of some very cunning camouflage and disguise schemes, however, um, elsewhere. For example, how many warships can you see in this photo? Now, uh, surface glance, you think, ah, oh, well, there's Hermes, a couple of uh, Revenge-class battleships, and yes, that's exactly what the Royal Navy wanted you to think. In fact, there are no warships in this picture, well, except for maybe that tiny speck of one up on the top right. Uh, the three big ships you can see here are all decoys. They're all merchant ships dressed up to look like Hermes and two revenge class. Um, there was also the old HMS Centurion that was doing a fairly convincing job of pretending to be King George V class. And uh, yeah, I think those... Well, I mean, if you look very closely, especially at the nearest one, you can kind of tell from the whole form that maybe something slightly off with it. But from a distance, and especially from the air, they did a pretty good job of deceiving the Germans into believing that the Royal Navy had odd numbers of battleships in weird places that they really probably shouldn't, but they couldn't really afford to take the risk that that wasn't the case. So yeah, there, there were a lot of different cunning camouflage schemes going on. Just You don't always have to pretend to be an island, although to be perfectly fair, I don't think anyone else was really that motivated to try it after the Dutch attempt, because really, that's going to take first prize. I mean, short of actually building your ship out of rocks and growing live plants on your deck with associated wildlife, you're not beating it. 22NF2 asks, During World War II, it seems as if the Kriegsmarine and the Imperial Japanese Navy considered the Indian Ocean to be a lower priority compared to other theatres. Granted, there were some forays by merchant raiders and pocket battleships, but they didn't try and deploy in earnest until the Monsoon Group began trying to operate out of Penang in 1943, Geographical factors aside, was there a reason for this? Uh, 
There were actually a surprising number of Axis operations in and around the Indian Ocean. Uh, kind of started off with German surface raiders, both the Deutschland types and um, disguised merchant raiders, plus some Italian submarines, one of which is seen here. And then it kind of transitioned over to Japanese, mostly air attacks, occasionally some surface and sub action, and then, as you mentioned, U boats. So the Indian Ocean. It, w it was a slightly lower priority, but that wasn't because the Axis didn't recognise its importance. The Indian Ocean was hugely important to the Allied war effort. The main problem was, as you suggest, geographical. The Germans and Italians, once um, Italian Ethiopia and that sort of area had, and Italian Somaliland had been uh, suppressed... To get there with fresh ships or fresh submarines, well, they weren't going to go through the Gulf, through the Suez Canal, were they? Because the British had control of that, so they'd have to go all the way around Africa, which is uh, something of a tall order, especially because, well, for the Italians, they've got to get out of the Mediterranean past the Gibraltar Straits. Then they've got to go all the way around Africa. The Germans have to get out past the UK into the Atlantic, down the Atlantic, around Africa, etc. So it's a little bit of a long distance trek. Um, and not too many friendly places to operate from. The Japanese are a little bit closer, but the Allies still have places like um, Ceylon, what's now Sri Lanka. Um, they're still fighting in Burma. You've got Australia down to the south. And so there's going to be Allied operations to try and interdict them going that way. And also, well, by the time the Japanese have kind of consolidated all their ex expansions to the point where they're comfortably in a position to cause problems in that area they have a, a very big US Navy shaped problem coming the other way which tended to distract them a little bit from um, commerce raiding in the Indian Ocean Robert Henry Ilston asks I just recently watched a special on US submarines during World War II performing lifeguard duty did the boats mark their hulls with successful missions like they would if they had sunk a vessel and also in terms of air crew members held on submarines before being transferred off, what was the longest they were held on? Did they have to go into combat with the air crew aboard? What would they be expected to do? Were they given basic training in things like damage control, etc.? In terms of marking their hulls with successful missions like they would if they'd sunk a vessel, a successful tour, I'm not immediately aware of that being a common practice, although given the sheer variety shall we say of attitudes in various US sub crews and um your sub commanders and indeed submarine crews and commanders generally would normally given a fair bit more freedom than their surface based counterparts it wouldn't surprise me if some people did it um but it's not not common practice as far as i'm aware now as far as air crew aboard submarines is concerned I have covered this somewhat in the past, in a previous dry dock, um, so I won't go back over everything that's held therein, but in terms of what they're expected to do, it was mostly stuff based on the testimonies of some people who were uh, plucked from the water by various subs, including um, former US President George Bush Sr. Um, mainly appears to consist of things such as standing watch. Um, so it doesn't require a tremendous amount of training and keeps them away from the more delicate bits of machinery. And to be honest, if you're air crew, you would have had a pretty decent um, eye test score. So standing watch is probably a good idea for them to do. And also, well, especially if you're strike air crew, you'll have been trained to identify what Japanese ships look like. So probably a good place to put them. Um, <laughs> Basic da training and damage control on a submarine, well, they probably would have been told some, but again, it depends largely on what's going on on that particular sub at that particular time. Um, a lot of damage control is not something you want someone who's just been shown a quick 10-minute course on to be trying to do, especially on a sub, to be perfectly honest. In a submarine, if there's serious damage control to be done, unless it's something really simple like take this bucket, chuck it out the top... Um, you probably just want the air crew to stay out of the way while the people who know what they're doing handle it. As far as the longest time any air crews remained on board, well, you've got to bear in mind, 
US subs on patrol, their total patrol would last around about a month and a half, two months on average. And obviously, if they're picking up um, air crew, they've already done the whole transition from base to area of operations part. So I don't know the exact record, but it would surprise me if anyone was aboard a submarine for much longer than about a month um, or so. And obviously, if they picked up lots of air crew, they're probably going to head back sooner than that. I, I do know some air crew were aboard for kind of high 20s of days, but I've not really, I haven't heard of much of anyone who was aboard for much longer than that. Admiral Tiberius asks, were the foods on American and British ships that sailors ate in World War II mostly the same, or were they unique I items that were only seen in one navy or the other did british ships have issues resupplying food when in u.s ports and vice versa so of course uh, aboard british ships beer rum and tea were very common aboard american ships things like ice cream and coffee were more common although there would be a little bit of coffee on british ships and probably some tea on american ships when it comes to food items the american Navy actually was slightly better organised, believe it or not, than the Royal Navy in that respect, in that they actually had standardised rations of varying degrees that could be issued to ships, and then the cooks would have to make do with whatever it was. So um, there, there was also, to be fair, still an element somewhat similar to Age of Sail, where if a ship was in a friendly port, they could usually stock up on some really nice fresh supplies, but those would gradually run out and they'd have to revert back to the rations as they got further out to sea even in world war ii for royal navy ships it was much more a case of well the officer or officers in charge of dealing with food supplies had a budget and sometimes the navy would have stores there ready to go uh, other times they'd have pre-arranged supply arrangements with people in the vicinity but what exactly you got was kind of down to what the um, supply officers decided they liked or the ship's company liked. So you might find aboard one Royal Navy ship, for example, that the people who were grabbing all the food were picking up a lot of rice if everyone thought that rice was a good thing to eat and that was a fairly popular majority thing on another ship you might find virtually no rice but massive amounts of potatoes and on another ship you might find not a tremendous amount of rice and potato or potato but you might find let's say um, a lot of quite a lot of bread um, and grain products being used um, pastries and that kind of thing so yeah it's it's it, trying to pin down what the Royal Navy ate is pretty much a science and an art unto itself. But generally, kind of beef, pork, bread, potatoes, jam, marmalade, that kind of thing, those would be relatively commonly found aboard British ships. The impression I get looking through some American ships' menus is that things like uh, poultry sort of turkey chicken um spam um <laughs> well, obviously not a poultry item but slightly different pork products so things like like spam and ham as opposed to sausages in the british navy um seem to have been more prevalent in the in the u.s navy and some very weird and interesting concoctions as well um obviously there'd be things like the thing, things that are commonly available in America, things like pumpkins, don't really feature too much in um, British uh, Royal Navy diets. But as far as resupply, um, it wasn't really too much of a problem. Sailors do tend to like some variety where they can get it, especially if they've been on a long voyage where they've been fed exactly the same thing all the time for ages. Um... So some poor U.S. sailors, especially trying to get their battle-damaged ships um, back to places like Pearl Harbor, would be reduced to spam, 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 and also spam. Um, at which point, if they saw anything that wasn't spam, they would probably eat it on sight. So I think when you've got U.S. ships in British ports, if they don't have access to American rations and obviously um, um, British ships in American ports 
or other places like Australia where they don't have access to the typical kinds of food you might expect to find in British ports, they'll probably just go, oh yeah, cool, variety. Um, there's some stuff that we know, like potatoes, and there's other stuff that we don't usually have, so we'll we'll try a bit of that. And if it works, it's great. If everyone likes it, fantastic. And if they don't like it, well, you're stuck on a ship, you're eating it anyway, mate. <laughs> um, and if you happen to run across a friendly American or British ship, depending on obviously which navy you're serving in, do some quick and illicit trades and try and hide the ice cream stains and don't look quite so drunk, depending on, again, which ship you're on after it's all been traded. Adony asks, do you have a least favourite era of naval history in the eras that you consider part of the channel? And if you do, which one and why? I, hmm, it's a difficult question because I can think of positives for most of the naval eras that are covered by the channel. And to be fair, the channel will as long as I can find the right, either the right knowledge and expertise or the right resources, cover anything that's pre-1950, even like 1950 BC. <laughs> um, but um, I'd say if if there was an area of na era of naval history where I'd probably go, eh, oh, not really looking forward to that too much, I would probably look at I'll probably be looking at something like the 1100s to 1300s, something like that. The, yeah, the probably those two centuries. Mainly because, at least in the areas of naval history that I have some knowledge of, there's not really a tremendous amount exciting happening. I mean, there's a bit going on in the Mediterranean with... Um, various crusades and stuff and random hilarious encounters between big well for the time big northern european ships that are meandering vaguely and somewhat out of control through swarms of lightly built galleys while everyone kind of stares at each other and wonders how on earth we're supposed to fight each other in these completely different styles of warfare um but yeah most of the battles of that period are effectively we are fighting a land battle only there's an increased chance of drowning <laughs> merchant ships the difference between a merchant ship and a warship was practically none we, here's a merchant ship how are we making it into a warship we've made the fore and after castle slightly larger and we've put lots of men in shiny armor on it that's literally the extent of how to make a warship circa 1200 at least in say, in northern europe there are as far as I'm aware, some rather more interesting things going on um, elsewhere. Things like uh, Chinese treasure ships and such like, and various other developments. But I don't know anything close to enough about those to speak about them with authority. So if I was going to do a video on that, I would want to find someone who is an expert on that kind of era and location and basically do a kind of an, in, an interview style uh, video with them. Uh, this is one of the reasons, for example, why, although I really would like to, I haven't done yet done a video on Admiral Yi Sin Shin of the uh, Korean uh, Navy when he took on the Japanese Navy at, with his um, armoured ships. Simply because whilst, yes, I could give you the kind of the pop culture version that we get here in the West, I'm... I've read just enough about it to know that there is some degree of conflict in various sources about who who did what, where and when in various battles and why certain things happened, and some stuff that gets slightly overblown, other stuff that gets somewhat overlooked, uh, and so on and so forth. So rather than just uh, rehashing some of what is known already in the West, I would really want to get... Uh, a specialist historian who has studied um, that particular conflict and ideally that particular admiral in a bit more detail and have them tell us what exactly is going on there. Bill Luster asks, Ian Toll's book Six Frigates describes a political movement in the early 1800s to build a large fleet of sailing ships but store them at a high state of readiness in a giant cup of dry dock in Washington until needed. Uh, was that possible, practical or prudent for the era? How long would it take to spin up such a navy with former merchant crews, and how effective would they be relative to seasoned French, Spanish, or British crews? So, some of that I've touched on in my uh, 
video called The Forgotten Fleet, which is all about the uh, US sailing fleet in the period between the War of 1812 and the start of the American Civil War. But, um, yeah, there was this kind of idea, and it, it's one of these things that, in principle, it sounds like a good idea, because you can store wooden ships in what at the time was called in ordinary for a fairly long period of time um, before they become fully operational and you can even store them on the stocks for considerable considerable periods of time although getting them back into the dry and preserving them after you've launched them is something of a slightly more difficult thing to pull off um Building an entire fleet, then building a massive series of covered dry docks, and then maintaining them. Yes, in theory, you could do it. Um, with the resources available to the United States in the early 1800s, that is probably not going to happen. You, you could probably pull it off, theoretically, but that would require it would require almost as much money as at, to set up as actually building and keeping the ships fully operational anyway, and Congress was never going to pay for that. Um, as I've said many many times before, basically up until after the First World War, and perhaps to a certain extent even then, the all previous history of the USA when it comes to the Navy has been, we don't want to pay for a single thing. We will not have a Navy of any particular description. Please go away with your begging bowl. Oh, there's a war over. Oh, right. I guess we should actually probably have a Navy quickly. Build, 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 build. Oh, the war's over. Oh, right. You get no money anymore. Scrap everything. That's basically Congress's attitude. Uh, the fact that the Americans even had the six frigates and a few ancillary craft ready to go for the War of 1812 was in and of itself a something of a miracle b not something that a large number of u.s congressmen were actually in favor of and c in significant part down to the fact that there had been a series of on again off again wars and not quite wars with the french and the barbary pirates and stuff that had just about managed to give the u.s navy enough of an excuse to exist that congress couldn't quite tell them to go scrap them all <laughs> um so yeah if they had gone for it and as i funding wise i don't think congress would ever have shaken the funds loose but if they had i suspect what would have happened is some clever person in congress using very big air quotes there would have gone along and said oh yes well that they're, they're fine they're they're in this dry dock they're, nothing's happening to them we don't need to maintain them do we would cut the maintenance budget they'll be absolutely fine in 20 years and they come back and find they've got like dry rot or mildew or something that's ruined them all which to be fair actually did happen to um in not so many words did actually happen to a couple of uh the us's sailing ships of the line when they actually came to try and use them um, albeit they weren't in giant covered dry docks but there you go um assuming things are kept in ordinary reasonably well getting them back out and into service doesn't take too long a uh, matter of months usually assuming you know what you're doing but as you've identified the, the big problem would be yeah if you're going to take a bunch of former merchant crews and bearing my merchant ships don't have anything like the hundreds of men you need to crew a ship of the line if you're grabbing around a merchant crews who probably don't want to be in the Navy and telling them, right, you are now in the Navy along with all these other crews you've never met before and trying to bash them all into shape to form some kind of actual war fighting vessel, that's not going to work out very well for you at all. Um, yeah, if you took that up against a bunch of actual professional sailors in a ship that they know intimately and have been sailing around in and practicing in for years that is a very very quick and easy way to add a new ship to whatever navy you're fighting's collection <laughs> um yeah not 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 a good plan not a good plan at all michael william jane asks 
I've heard you talk about the Sink the Bismarck movie. Uh, the question is, what happened to the Repulse? She started out with King George V, and in your five-minute guide, did say that she found a supply ship that was out to support Bismarck. Did they send her out to find Aunt Bismarck on her own, to have more ships covering more ground after Hood was sunk? Uh, and if she did find her, was she to shadow Bismarck? It seems like they wouldn't want her to take Bismarck on one-on-one. -on -one. So Repulse was actually out escorting a convoy at the time that Bismarck uh, made itself known. It joined the search, obviously, as did all other Royal Navy ships. However, um, coming just off of a fairly lengthy convoy escort mission, Repulse was somewhat low on fuel, and so she had to actually break off the search to go and refuel before they managed to track down Bismarck to its final location. Now, with that said... If she hadn't had to do that and she still had plenty of fuel, she still wouldn't have been engaging Bismarck 1v1. The Royal Navy was very conscious, obviously in light of Hood's destruction, that some of their more less less well should we say less well protected ships might not last too long in an engagement with Bismarck. So they were quite happy to send King George V and Rodney in after her. Um, but well Renown was obviously modernised compared to Repulse, and Renown was a lot closer <laughs> than Repulse ever got, uh, obviously accompanying Ark Royal, and Renown was ordered do not engage Bismarck, pretty much unless Bismarck was already heavily engaged with everybody else. Now, theoretically, that meant that Renown could have come in at the closing at bits of the action and had a go at Bismarck as well, but... Uh, as it turned out, the fight was over fairly quickly and Renown was quite happy off with Ark Royal and there wasn't really the time, even if it had, they'd had the inclination, to go and engage. So Repulse, obviously being not quite as upgraded as Renown, would have received exactly the same orders, i.e. don't engage, um, unless Bismarck's heavily engaged. However, because Repulse would have been on general search rather than Renown being tied to Ark Royal, if Repulse had had sufficient bunkerage, um, remaining to stay with the search, it's fairly probable she would have hung around in the background and then probably joined Dorsetshire in um, pounding Bismarck on her unengaged side once Rodney had ensured that Bismarck was no longer really a, an effective fighting unit. And that brings us to the end of this week's Drydock. Thank you very much for listening. Just two quick bits of channel admin. Um, the ship design competitions are back. We've got a new way of getting the judging panel involved um, in a lot faster and a lot better um, way. So hopefully results will be turned around a lot quicker. Uh, this time the competition is to design a Washington cherry tree type battle cruiser. Um, link to the competition design document in the description below. Please do take a look at it to determine uh, specifications etc. And separately, the Battleship Texas Foundation are, have started a YouTube channel where they are going to be charting some of the work they're doing in repairing, refitting, and restoring the USS Texas. Again, a link to them in the description below if you want to go and check them out. And whilst I'm here, obviously, also shout out to another Battleship's YouTube channel, the Battleship New Jersey, um, who are producing a lot of very interesting um, very information-rich content with uh, with their curator doing most of the uh, camera face-to-face -face work. So again, link to them also in the description. So with all that said and done, thank you very much, and I'll see you again in Patreon Drydock 131.